Hi. Um, uh, if we're on, I want to say good morning. Uh, I'm Tom Tyholt. I'm welcoming you to the third Social Business Book Club Hangout on air. Uh, this book club is brought to you by Wiley and by Social Media Today. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Jeff Corhan. Um, Jeff did a great webinar this past July for Social Media Today. He is the author of Built-in Social, Essential Social Marketing Practices for Every Small Business. There is a Q&A app, and we really want to, Jeff and I will have a conversation, but we really want to get your questions and get you involved and get you um, to participate in this Hangout. So uh, without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to just jump in, and uh, you see Jeff's book behind him. Um, let's start first with a little bit uh, uh, about you, Jeff. Um, tell me a little bit about your uh, uh, the business you started and that experience and, and what you learned from that. Corporate world, I did a decade of uh, marketing for a large uh, petroleum company and decided that it was time to start a business and I decided to start a landscape business so you know even having an MBA it's pretty amazing when you have no small business experience and no support system and you get out there you realize how little you know and I did the only thing that made sense to me I just started talking to other people that were uh, landscape contractors and how do you do this and how do you do that and um, the more I talked and the more I listened uh, the more I learned that what I was learning was inconsistent. Everybody seemed to be doing things differently. Uh, so I tried to educate myself, you know, community colleges, things like that, but there really wasn't a whole lot available. So, um, you know, that kind of progressed through a period of months. So I, I hadn't really started at that point. I'm still trying to figure out how to get started. And when I finally did have some viable prospects, I decided that it was time to do some promotion to get more prospects, more customers. And uh, everybody did, though, agree on one thing, and that was advertising in the Yellow Pages. And I checked out the Yellow Pages, and what I discovered was, first of all, it's very expensive. Second of all, it didn't make sense to me why I wanted to be on the same page with all of my competitors. And, and you know, I, I just kind of pushed it aside. I said, you know, I, I don't have the money for this. It doesn't make sense to me. So I just trusted my gut, and what did make sense to me was educating the people that I wanted to do business with, basically uh, homeowners in areas that were developing and that needed landscaping. And so what I did was I sought out these neighborhood bulletins, they're called, where you could buy ad space. So this is before digital, so you couldn't uh, actually do what we do today with content marketing. But what I basically did was I didn't advertise per se. What I did was educate them. I helped them understand better ways of pruning and better ways to do so many things because uh, then I was able to, when I did get a phone call, to point to their landscape and say, we could improve this, we could <laughs> extend the longevity of your plants. And, and you know, things just, just kind of made sense to people because nobody had ever really tried to educate them before like that. So I was basically doing content marketing before. Um, you know, it had a name, and of course, that's something you know, we all need to be doing these days. You, while you were educating them, you were essentially creating content for them. Yes. Right. Yes, and it was. Trust me, it was very crude. I mean, I can't draw that well at all. But I, mm -hmm. and I, again, I couldn't afford a graphic artist, so I just drew diagrams of how things worked, and it it worked. In fact, I think it was probably. You know, another great lesson these days is you, you don't have to have a polished presence online. You really just have to be sincere and willing to help people and make connections, as you said, and, and, and you know, just basically help solve their problems for them, answer their questions. So let's now uh, jump to the, uh, to the book. And uh, uh, you found yourself, uh, when you began to uh, investigate social marketing for businesses, that there really weren't... Uh, books meant for the small business owner? Not in my opinion. There, there were a lot of great books out there, there still are, but not really in the language of a small business owner, meaning somebody that had been in the trenches. And so uh, typically they were written by people that come from media, and so the, the language was kind of above the heads of what I understood a small business 
uh, owner or manager or uh, employee to be because I speak to these groups and they kept asking me the same basic questions over and over again and they wanted resources and I gave them lists of almost hundreds of resources but of course they don't have the time to do that that sort of work so basically this book was written for the people that I work with every day that I speak to in my audiences to basically give them a model a method that breaks this down to the absolute basics and step one is basically building great content that serves the communities that you're working with that helps them make better buying decisions and ideally that means then working with your company. But you make a great point which is early in the book where, where you say uh, you know you don't have to be intimidated you don't have to fully understand social media you can start in uh, um, you know, don't let that be a barrier to starting in. Right. Well, I think I said a couple of things in there. Number one, you don't need a marketing degree because I even like to say that in, in many circumstances, I think somebody with the education I have can be a disadvantage. Uh, and you don't need to know the technology that well because that's easy enough to learn. What you really need, the, the most important thing, is an understanding of business, understanding your customers, understanding how you can help them, and basically that understanding gets more richer over time if you do then engage with them with social media so you know the truth is all of us that are using social media well these days we experimented we made mistakes and and I don't think there's anything wrong with going out there and making a few mistakes if that's what it takes to learn how to do this well well and you know making mistakes also can um, people are searching for authenticity uh, you know if you're real um, that's in some ways more important than you know having this sort of uh, um, glossy expertise. Right, right. I, I totally agree. Uh, now, uh, the first thing you say is that you basically uh, break it down to an essential content marketing strategy. So, do you want to walk us through a little bit of that? Wow. Uh, in <laughs> two minutes or less. All right, well, no, well, uh, 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 then let me let me uh, ask a different question. Um, how important is social to business? Well, in one of the chapters, I forget which one, basically comments on the fact that it's probably more important to understand the influences of social than to necessarily be using this media. So I think it's extremely important because even if you're not using social media, well, you have to understand that these days, unlike even a couple of decades ago, consumers have a voice, and they're using that voice. And if you're not responding to them, especially on those channels, they're not going to be real happy about continuing with your business. I mean, just to give an example without identifying the company, I have lifetime elite status with one of the airlines, and I had a problem where uh, my flight was canceled, and I didn't wasn't able to get on a plane. I, I had to get on another carrier, and this has been going on for months and months. Um, and I couldn't get my money back. And I basically said, "Hey, look, we had a contract. You know, let's forget the fact that I've been flying your airline since 1982." But you know, I was going through the customer service channels, no resolution. Finally, I got on Twitter. That got even worse. Um, eventually, I, I reached somebody with you know some some uh, understanding of the situation, and, and we we process things. But the truth is, I think a lot of people would have been uh, reached the breaking point and just said, "I'm I'm done working with your business," because these days people make decisions so quickly, and if you're not responding and you're not trying to help them, they have a lot of choices out there, thanks to the web, basically. Well, and this is a time when selling is changing too. Uh, so, so talk a little bit about that. The ways in which you see it changing. Oh my goodness! You know, when I started in the corporate world in '82, I didn't have a lot of training, um, but I had a territory. Uh, it was basically the United States and Canada, and a client base. And what I did discover by accident was, you know. Intuitively, I hope you know maybe that's by accident. Was you know just I, I was charged with visiting these customers and helping them re remain customers with our company. And what I learned was you know they just wanted somebody to listen to them and to help them. 
And that was selling. It, it's not selling, like, you know, you don't really learn selling in college these days. I suppose there are a lot more training programs than there used to be, but, uh, you know, in my mind these days, so if selling was helping back then when it had to be done basically face-to-face -face or over the telephone, it, it's the same thing. Helping is selling. These days we're doing it digitally. We call that marketing, but in my mind, uh, selling and marketing are absolutely merging into one basically uh, discipline with which you need to be using both because, uh, let's face it, you have a relationship with people before you even know you have a relationship with them because they're already sizing you up from your website, your blog, your social media content. Uh, so you're selling, in my opinion, if that content is out there. And that's a great thing because it's working you know, 24-7 for you. And if you're engaging on a regular basis, wow, you're 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 moving your business forward. Great. And uh, to take this a step further, then communities you say are the new markets. Right. Well, so that's what I was alluding to about uh, the MBA being kind of irrelevant. You know, because back then we talked about attacking markets and segmenting markets and dividing markets. You know, was this militaristic kind of bureaucratic model, whereas in a social influenced business environment you just go out there and make friends you know you live and you work in these communities that's that's how you need to market these days is you don't need a big complicated model I hope you have some sort of a an idea of how you're going to approach things but basically getting out there making connections getting to know people uh, it, it's not nearly as challenging as it used to be but you still have to solve problems provide solutions and as you say, educate, educate uh, your customer and do them a, a service. Your kind, the the uh, relationship has become a little more um, uh, involved because of social media. Right. Well, see, people instantly know a lot about you uh, before you even engage with them. They know if you're pulling their leg. They know if you know your business. So if you don't know them very well, um, that's going to come through pretty quickly, and that's going to really work to your disadvantage. So on my podcast, I recently interviewed a young lady who um, is in the automobile business. She sells cars and trucks and so forth, and she's in Montana, and she says, think about this. You know, there are very few women that do what I do, and think about my marketplace. You've got ranchers and, and men, I'm sure, that come in and say, and they see her, and they're thinking, what could she possibly no. Could she possibly know as much about trucks as I do? Well, she does because she knows her business and that basically applies to all of us where our prospective buyers probably know as much if not more about the products and services we are selling before we even engage with them because they've done their homework and so maybe they don't know exactly what our company can provide but they probably surely know what all the competitors are doing and they're looking for kind of the the, the thing that will you know, tip them over and say, this is the company I'm going to work with. And I suggest to you that that is something about the personality, the culture, you know, the human aspects of that business, the social aspects of that business, if you want to call that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things you say in your book um, is that we're all in the publishing business now. And, and I thought that was very striking. Talk a little bit about that. Well, we are. So, so think about this. Every person is basically their own brand, their own media brand, if you will, because they've got access to YouTube and Facebook and all the places that they're publishing. So think about what it says when a business is not publishing content online. It, it, you know, there's a complete, absolute disconnect for all of those people that live in this digital world that understand it and embrace it. They look at you like you would have looked at somebody 20 years ago that didn't have a business card, let's say, or didn't have a print right. brochure. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it, we are all media companies because in the old days, so I comment in the book, you know, to, to get that landscaping business off the ground, I had to use neighborhood bulletins. I did press releases. That was another big thing I did because uh, I was able to get the newspapers to publish articles. I was able to get a few magazines to do the same. We don't need those uh, um, uh, outlets anymore. I mean, if we can take advantage of them, great, but the truth is most businesses, especially small business, are going to start with the free media and they're going to take it from there because, honestly, to try to get, uh, let's say, 
any attention from a newspaper these days is, is virtually impossible because their business, I have to believe, is declining. So unless you're willing to advertise. And so, you know, it, it's just a whole different dynamic these days that we have to take control of our media because we are the media. You and I sitting here right now having this conversation is media. People want to hear from regular people. And, and that's the interesting thing. They don't want to hear from the business. Most people, studies prove, if you go back over the past several decades, that 80% of all consumers do not trust businesses, whether that is a large or a small business, but they do trust a person within the business. And that's why it's so vital for somebody to step out there, get into the media, be a human being, talk about the personal aspects of the business, the human aspects about it. And, uh, you know, it, it's humanizing, it's engaging, it works. You know, I, I tell people all the time, if you think about um, Red Bull and GoPro, they now market themselves as media companies. People right. go to the GoPro site to see the videos. I mean, uh, 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 they don't even talk about, they don't even have to tell you about the camera because you're watching people use it. Same thing with Red Bull. They're uh, a lifestyle brand as much as an energy drink. Uh, which is kind of interesting to see how successful that's been for those two big examples. But uh, in your book, you sort of say that it can be successful for small uh, businesses as well to create. Sure. Content. So it's a matter of figuring out what your resources are, what you're good at. Um, you know, I'm not as comfortable in front of video as many other people are. That's why I tend to use my podcast. I love doing the podcast. I love having conversations with people. But so think about this example. You've got this major motion picture. I think it's called the Lego movie, but you know what I'm talking about. Right. Um, they Lego invested like sixty million dollars into that production. They are a brand, but they're financing that media. So and what is that media doing? It's not really selling in a traditional way like buy Lego products, but it's educating people about Lego. It's getting them excited about it. It's putting the Lego brand out there. And so that is what we are going to see, a huge shift in that direction where, because brands have money and not all media companies have enough money to, to put on a production like that. And it, the same thing is going to work for a business. I mean, a business gets up to a certain level. It, it, it can afford to create its own you know, I wouldn't say a major motion picture, but higher quality videos. Um, that's not to say they should walk away from doing the stuff we've done every day, like having informal conversations like this, but really creating a mix of, you know, this evergreen kind of cornerstone content that lives forever out there that you never have to go back and, and fix because it's always going to be relevant. And, and what's it going to do? It's going to, you know, it's going to educate, it's going to inform, it's going to solve problems because in every single industry, the problems never go away because people come in and out of these industries and most people don't take action so just because you've solved a problem with your media doesn't mean that everybody's you know engaged with that solution and that's why I suggest to people just continue to do you're never done your work is never done you're always wanting to be creating more media um, let's go back to the landscape business so there was a practice that's been around forever and it still is today it's called um, we call them mulch volcanoes. So when you plant a tree, you're supposed to have so uh, mulch to protect the root system and hold in the moisture and the nutrients and so forth at the base of that tree. Well, a lot of people just kind of pile it up where it looks like this. That traps moisture and insects and so forth, all kinds of things against the bark and causes problems. Um, those existed 20 years ago, 30 years ago when I was running that business. They exist today. Now, you know that all kinds of companies have published solutions to them, but but that's the solutions are right out there in front of us every single day. Uh, it's just up to us to be publishing a solution that links then back to us, that makes us an authority, makes us somebody within those local communities where somebody can say, well, you know, I've read about all these solutions online, but this guy's right here in our hometown. He's the guy I'm probably going to work with, or gal. So to that end, do you recommend that even a small business devote a portion of their marketing budget to, um, you know, having better content, uh, uh, you know? I do. I totally do. I, in fact, I'm starting to do a lot more of that type of work. I didn't really intend to become a media agency. 
but the truth is there is an absolute hunger for quality content out there and one of the reasons is not everybody has the skills another reason is there's so much Unef ineffective content out there where well, people are just you know just throwing content out there saying hey look you know hey, you're, you're speaking to the choir here because I, I work with brands now myself you know and basically um, um, to get that kind of authenticity you really need someone who can create content that um, uh, you know that really speaks to the both the business and the people and as you say or to uh, establish yourself as an expert it helps to have a book um, it helps to have a uh, um, a place where people can say oh this is what this person stands for and what they do and all that is very helpful to a brand these days right well, so if, if if you were a brand and I was being hired to help you with your content and you just said Jeff just create the content for me I would have to spend a lot of time getting to know you your business and so forth the brand right. you can't just jump in I don't think uh, so how I do this is I make my clients create the content then I help them make it better it has to come from within you know that that message because there's something genuine and authentic and uh, it's hard to figure out what that is but the the business knows what that is, and and all they got to do is start talking, or start writing, or start making videos, or whatever, and eventually enough of that's going to come out. And then yes, I, I do believe we've we've reached the point where you have to get somebody that understands how SEO works, understands how content works, just to you know to refine it. Maybe you don't have to do that with all of your content, but I think at least to have a portion of really high quality content out there. And again. Uh, uh this goes back to or extends on what one of the chapters in your book that relationship selling uh, is so important because we're now in the trust economy. Mm -hmm. Talk about the trust economy a little bit. Well, it's the trust economy is basically <laughs> when we have so many options and we do in virtually every single industry, we are always going to work with the person that we trust. And so right. I suggest that that we probably don't have the competition that we think we have in many situations because once people trust you and all things are equal that trust is enough that that's what tips things in your favor but I believe because I know this to be a fact that even when people even when you may not be the best choice the highest quality the lowest price people will still choose you if they trust you if they like you and so those two kind of go together uh, but the truth is we, we want to work with people that we know like and trust everybody knows that but we underestimate how important that is because when I ran that business I had a, a key competitor who we were just complete opposites and so we quote unquote competed a lot but the truth was when I lost the business or he lost the business it was because there was alignment there there, there was kind of a, a chemistry a trust factor how he did it, I don't know. How I did it was different, and so it was it was pretty easy. We weren't taking business from each other. It was just basically just putting who we were out there, and and hopefully building up that trust level. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Micheline. Uh, sh uh, she's asking uh, how should small businesses establish their budget for content production? Uh, any ideas? Because we recognize that very few people have the skills or the time to do so. What I would suggest is is try to dedicate the budget, whatever can be set aside, to creating at least um, a few high quality pieces of content, and then dedicate yourself to uh, atomizing them. Is is the the, the term which in because I hate the term repurpose. You know, it, when people hear that, it's like okay, now I'm going to throw it on Facebook. Now I'm going to throw it over here. Atomizing your content is to basically taking a high quality, let's say, long form piece of content, taking the image over to uh, Pinterest, let's say, or to Instagram, breaking it down into multiple blog posts. Uh, so if I were going to invest with a professional, I would have them help me create the high quality content, and then I would you know, use the in-house resources to atomize it or break it down 
and put it out there in, in different formats because you can you can easily take a piece of content and, and repurpose it for lack of a better word to six, seven, eight channels but you can honestly, if you really work at it, slide share, you have all these resources that many of us don't use enough, uh, you could probably take a, a great piece of content and put it into probably 20 different channels or formats and, and it, again, it's going to live out there. So that's how I would dedicate my budget would be towards something that's really, really high quality and um, you know, the right keywords, titles that get people's attention, content that delivers on those headlines or titles, um, readability broken down with subheadings and bolded, uh, uh, bolding the, the um, you know, the, 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 the important phrases, tweet this, uh, you know, to the, to some, some of those phrases. I mean, there's so many ways that that can be done. So um, I think a lot of businesses would, would probably be shocked at what it would take to hire somebody to create the content for them. But the truth is, done well, a great piece of content takes a lot of time. You could spend a day working on one podcast if you're creating the show notes and so forth and putting images to it. You could do the same thing with one long form piece of article, but uh, one long form article, but I would suggest do that. Create one great article every quarter if that's all you can do and then just share it and, and repurpose it and, and break it down and put images to it and encourage that's others to share really it and so forth. That's really helpful and Michelin follows up by saying where should businesses start in, in sort of addressing social for their business because mo most of them kind of don't even know where to start. I have what I call the four pillars of successful online marketing. So number one is having a website that is ideally mobile responsive, but let's call that a modern high quality website. And most of us can do a better job on our websites, but you certainly need a website because you need something to drive traffic back to. You need a blog, I believe, because that's the content that you own on, a, on the domain that you own that you are updating frequently. You know, Google likes frequent updates. It sends a positive message to them because it sends a positive message to the community you serve. If you are consistently sharing great content, you need a newsletter because, again, that's a digital asset that you own. So those three, you own your website, you own that content, nobody can take it away. You own that blog because it's on a domain that you own. You own your newsletter community. You don't really own them, but they've given you permission to interrupt them with content. So in a, in a sense, you know, you've got that list. And then the fourth pillar is, I would say, one or two social media channels. And so that's kind of the minimum um, presence that everybody needs. What I see happen most often is businesses are scattered across every single channel, which basically means they're not doing any of them well. So I put my absolute best work into my newsletter. Uh, some of that content finds its way to my blog. I, I do a decent job on my website, and I do my best on social media. But see, it, it's, social media always seems to be the afterthought. So um, if it's it, to make it better and stronger, pick one channel where you think your community resides. In other words, go where they are. Don't try to build a community and say, hey, meet us on Facebook or meet us on Instagram or meet us on Google+. Find out where they're at and focus in on those channels. You appear to be frozen, so I'm not hearing anything, which means the, you may have dropped your signal. Okay. <laughs> okay, I see that message. So uh, it sounds like we're going to maybe end here.
Okay.